1842, Nikolai Gogol publishes a short story called The Overcoat, which is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, this short story is a rather tragic story. It's about a guy named Akake Akakievich. There seems to be a lot of alliteration in that name, and in fact, uh, Nikolai Gogol spends time explaining the moronic process in which his name got chosen. It really doesn't actually matter. Akake Akakievich was just an ordinary guy who was born and lived and died, and I think that's one of the reasons why his name is so important uh, be, and, and, and so dumb. Akaki Akakievich, that just sounds odd, um, is because Akakievich was a nobody. At some point in time, Akakievich, again, Nikolai Gogol doesn't spend time talking about Akakievich's childhood. Uh, he just says that at some point in time, he joins the department. Now, we don't know what the department is, but it's probably some kind of uh, governmental position. And uh, Akakievich is hired on as a clerk who copies. And he's actually really good at copying and, in fact, really gets into it. Nikolai Gogol says that whenever he's copying, you could see the letters form on his face. He would be so concentrated uh, in copying down um, whatever his officials told him to copy. And... Uh, the fact is, as I mentioned earlier, he was really good at it, but despite the fact that he was good at it, he still didn't move up in rank or title. He always stayed as that simple, humble copying clerk. He never moved up anywhere. He never got any promotions. He never made more money, even though he was a man of very consistent at his job and with neat penmanship. So to really reinforce this idea of Akakievich being no one, Popkin, uh, sorry, Gogol, <laughs> I, I get my authors confused. Um, so to really reinforce that Akakievich was a nobody, uh, Nikolai Gogol describes what he looks like in two places. So thus in a certain department, there served a certain official, this being Akakievich. The officials cannot be described as very remarkable. He was shortish, somewhat pockmarked, with somewhat reddish hair, apparently with somewhat less than per perfect eyesight, with a somewhat baldish pate, wrinkles on both sides of his cheeks, and endowed with what might be called a hemorrhoidal expression. Well, that can't be helped. St. Petersburg climate is to blame. So by that, you just get this appearance of this man who looks dull, kind of bald, and you know, the kind of guy you'd look at and you'd say, oh, he's a loser. Um, the other young officials where that, that worked around Akakievich would always mock Akakievich, especially when he was really concentrated. They would, they would uh, mock him and try to hold his hand or make his hand, you know, squiggle, jostle his hand so that his penmanship would be, would be um, messed up. And it was only then when Akakievich would look up and tell them to stop bothering him. But uh, there's, there's something really interesting here. Um, but all this reward, and I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to read a passage here that's describing how much um, Akakievich loved copying things. And it says, he loved copying things. Had he been suitably rewarded for the, his zeal in copying things, he might well have become, to his great astonishment, a state counselor. But all his reward, as his witty workmates put it, was a badge on his front side and piles on his backside. So, <laughs> Gogol is basically saying that Akakievich was a dumpy-looking guy. And this is reinforced, in fact, by the overcoat. Because the overcoat is the really central theme of the story. See, Akakievich was a very poor man. He was just a clerk. And so he couldn't afford new clothes. And so he wore this same overcoat for years in the department. Um, and it became more threadbare and more threadbare and more threadbare over the years. And eventually, it didn't protect him at all from the bitter St. Petersburg cold. And so the only thing that Akakievich could do was buy a new overcoat. And in fact, Gogol makes it very clear how he was forced into buying this overcoat. Because the old overcoat he was buying, he was wearing, was so threadbare and had been patched so many times, it would have been impossible to patch it up. So, Akakievich goes to his tailor and requests a new coat. Now, the only problem is Akakievich had to go on a very long, arduous, extreme budget cut uh, just to afford this coat. The fact is. <laughs> 
He had to do without his evening tea. He wouldn't light candles in the evening. And he would walk on tiptoes so as to preserve his shoe leather. But he needed, he desperately needed this overcoat. And so then the day comes when he finally gets this overcoat. And, and Gogol makes a point of saying that when, when Akakievich went to buy his overcoat, it changed him somehow. All of a sudden, the world became more bright because he was actually doing something that he had never done before in his life, which was buying something new, something extravagant, even something as necessary as an overcoat. It changed Akakievich. All of a sudden, he saw the world with a different light. He was more bold. He would look up from copying his papers with a smile. And so then the day comes, he gets the overcoat, he puts it on, and it's a perfect fit. And it, he looks so dashing. <laughs> Old Dumpy Okakievich looks so dashing in this overcoat that when he gets to work, his boss, the official over him, invites him to a party for the first time in his life. Now... He goes to this party, and he doesn't know what he's doing there. He's bored at the party. Uh, it's his first time at a party, so he doesn't know what to do. He just says he doesn't know where to place his feet, where to put his hands. Uh, he's just he's still not fitting in, despite the fact that he has a nice overcoat. Well, it's late, and Akakievich leaves. And he has to walk back across the city of St. Petersburg, back to his house, kind of on the outskirts. And so he's walking, and as he walks, it keeps on getting darker and darker because there's less street lamps as he walks. And then it says that he comes to a place. By now, he was near the point where the street opened into a vast square, a terrible void on the far side of which the buildings were barely visible. In the far distance, he could see shining the lamp of a sentry booth which appeared to stand on the very edge of the world, and at this point, Akaki Akakievich's good cheer faded perceptibly. He struck across the square with an involuntary sense of dread, as if with inner premonitions that something bad was about to happen. He looked behind and about him. It was as though he were on the high seas. No, better not look around, he thought, and walked on with his eyes shut, only opening them to see how far he was from the edge of the square. Instead, there, standing right before his nose, were a couple of men with mustaches, although he still could not see them very clearly. His head started to swim, and his heart pounded. Hey, that's my coat you're wearing, exclaimed one of them with a threatening voice and seized him by the collar. Akake Akakievich was on the point of calling for help when the other put his fist the size of a civil servant's head against his jaw and growled, Just you try and shout. After this, all Akake Akakievich could recall was that they removed his coat. Then one gave him a kick, whereupon he fell on his back in the snow and felt nothing more. So Akakievich is a poor, dumpy old man who can't afford a new overcoat, but finally actually is able to buy a new overcoat, and as soon as he buys it, is robbed of this overcoat. And to make things matters worse, Akakievich the next day goes to an official, uh, a police official presumably. Uh, Gogol never makes explicit who it is, it just says an important personage. He goes to this important personage, and he says, could you help me find my coat that was stolen from me? And the important personage uh, blows him off. In fact, he yells at him so loudly, it, it, uh, <laughs> it uh, puts Akakievich into a state of shock, wherein he leaves the important personage's house and walks back to his house through the bitter St. Petersburg cold. And as a result of not having an overcoat or not having one that fit well, uh, he catches a cold and dies. The end. No, no, actually, it's not the end. Not the end there. There's something weird that happens. After Akakievich dies, people begin to report of this ghost wandering around St. Petersburg that, that, that walks up to people and snatches their overcoat. And this happens too many times. There's a big complaint about it. No one knows what this ghost is. There's one official from the department where Akakievich worked at that saw the ghost from a distance and said, ah, I think that's, I think that's, uh, I think that's Akakievich. But then, of course, he turns and runs because no one likes seeing ghosts, right? So, remember that important personage who blew Akakievich off? Well, 
Once upon a time, after Kakevich's death, this important personage gets in his sleigh because he's going to go visit his mistress. And Gogol makes makes very clear to point out that uh, the important personage had a young, beautiful wife, as beautiful as his mistress, uh, but it's not in our place to judge why certain people are scummy. So this important personage is in his sleigh, and all of a sudden, something jumps on him. And the important personage looks, and here... Here, it, here it's Akakievich. It's, it's Akakievich raised from the grave with this ghostly expression on his face and his mouth contorts and out comes this terrible stench of death. And he says, ah, now I have you. Give me my coat back. I want my coat. And he takes the important personage's coat. And after that incident, no one hears about the ghost anymore. Akakievich is laid to rest and the story concludes there. Or does it? <laughs> you remember you remember the descriptor that I read here for the ghost that stole Akakievich's coat. And I say ghost because there's 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 uh, Gogol makes a very very interesting case in the final paragraph that there are nonetheless some energetic and interfering people who are unwilling to let matters rest and claimed that the ghost was still appearing in outlying areas of the city. And then he goes on to state that there was a kind of a weak-minded and weak-eyed uh, um, constable who saw this ghost, who was following this what he thought was a man, and he saw this, this man, and, and the man turned around and he saw he was a ghost. And the man fits the description of the man who stole Akakievich's coat. You'll listen to this. The ghost, uh, the same weakling of a constable, lacked the courage to apprehend the ghost and instead followed it into the darkness until it suddenly stopped, swung around and asked, what do you want? Brandishing a fist such as you would see on no living man. Probably a fist the size of a, uh, what was the, what was the word? Um, uh, just a fist the size of a head. The constable replied nothing and beat a hasty retreat. The ghost was much taller, however, and sported the most enormous mustache. Heading off the direction of the Obukov Bridge, it was soon lost in the darkness. So you could here's here's my claim. I think I think uh, Gogol was very very witty when he tied in this this descriptor of a ghost with a mustache as being very nearly similar to the guy or the ghost who stole Akakievich's uh, coat. What if there were multiple ghosts in St. Petersburg that not necessarily stole coats, but were just wandering souls, people who had been, say, blown off by other officials who were left to die in the cold, and now their souls being restless wandered around in, 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 in the wind and the snow looking for some kind of resolution to their pain. And, yeah, that, so, so, I, so my, my big question is, was it a ghost that originally stole Akakievich's coat? I kind of think it was. I think it was a ghost, an opportunistic ghost, who, or, or a group of ghosts who, who stole his coat, which then led to Akakievich's death, which then led to Akakievich stealing more coats. But Akakievich, Akakievich finds some kind of resolution eventually. He's able to get vengeance on the man who originally wouldn't, on the, on the important personage, who wouldn't find his coat for him after it was stolen. So, the story, the overcoat, really reflects well the culture of St. Petersburg during that area, era, during the you know, mid-1800s. Um, it shows different bureaucratic systems. It shows rank and office and how you couldn't move up unless you were so talented or unless you looked so good. Um, it shows how people went through their, you know, whole... Uh, it, it, okay, here's, here's, here's kind of the thing. I think, his, I think the, the, one of the main points of the story is to show how there were many people who went through their St. Petersburg life as ghosts, not in the literal sense, but they were ghosts of people. Like Akakievich, they were untalented, poor, unattractive, and so no one ever saw them. No one ever moved them up in rank. 
They were invisible people. They were ghosts with threadbare overcoats, with nothing, they no money to buy new things. They were just seen as the scum of the earth, just like Akakievich was. Whenever they had things stolen from them, the important persons didn't listen to them, didn't help them find their own things, help them reclaim the things that they lost. No one ever looked at their humanity and loved them. They were invisible people. They were ghosts, weeping in the silence of this banal, ordinary, everyday existence. And at the end of the day, that's really what the overcoat is about. It's about an ordinary guy, unattractive guy, a guy you would never look at twice, who loses his coat and dies. And it's that very ordinariness that is somehow, somehow attractive.